Okay, thanks, Grant. Um, and uh, as you mentioned, Carson is unable to be here, so um, you know, I know you were expecting a sort of West Coast CTO put her in. Um, and, uh, I live east of here, and I'm not a king, uh, so I'll, I'll work on the winter, I suppose. Um, Mike, which book do I use? Is there a way to advance the slides in this? Is it possible to advance the slide? That's the correct logo. So I'll introduce myself while we get into the first slide. So I'm Paul Walker. Um, uh, I uh, did a PhD in gravitational physics, became a quant, ran risk for a chunk of gold, and ended up running technology for Goldman Sachs for uh, a while. Retired from that job a couple of years ago, and now have a variety of advisory relationships with private equity, uh, firms with some uh, fintech startups and some AI startups. Uh, one of my favorite of those relationships is my relationship with Volley. Volley is a really fantastic AI company that's transforming information into knowledge and deploying it into the enterprise so we can learn. And so the goal of this talk is to help you understand what that means. And how AI works, how it's changing, and what's actually happening today in AI. Uh, Okay, this is the older slide. That's a great headshot of me that someone else took. There wasn't supposed to be a slide. Hold on one second. <laughs> uh, so, um, if you don't remember a few things from this talk, I always like to start telling you what you should remember. So if you don't remember anything, you know what you should remember. And there's three big things I want you to remember. AI works. Okay, I'm going to unpack that a bit. But there's really been a change in the last decade that this technology called AI, which really means sort of clustering, predicting, analyzing data, playing games, recognizing images, understanding information. This is a technology that's gone from not working to working. We'll talk about that. The raw inputs to most of the things adults need to learn are digital. Right? How many things have you learned that haven't had a digital input in the last five years? We've actually had to go to a library and get a book my daughter's 12, I was trying to explain to her a card catalog, and she just, you know, she just didn't understand why that would be the way you do it, right? Um, and one subsection of AI, natural language processing, which is probably the hardest, one of the hardest subsets of AI, is right now, today, like, papers are getting printed in this month, undergoing a revolution in the way it works. So three important things. AI works, the inverse you're learning digital, natural language processing is undergoing a revolution. And what does that mean for you? What are the consequences for you as a learning professional? Okay, I said did a good, better, but. The good, you can build a learning system inside your organization that's as good as Amazon's recommendation engine. Okay, let's think about this for a second. How many of you bought something on Amazon? Raise your hand if you have ever purchased something on Amazon, right? Actually, raise your hand if you haven't. I suppose that's more interesting. <laughs> um, so if I go to Amazon and I buy a barbecue, by a Weber 22-inch grill, right? What's Amazon going to say? It's going to say, people who bought this barbecue also bought Tom's, right? That's great. How many of you have an experience for your learners in your learning system that's that good? As simple as, you're buying a barbecue, maybe you want Tom's, right? You wanted to learn about compliance. Hey, did you actually also want to learn about what the firm recently did with the SEC, right? That sort of human link, right? So at a minimum, let's try and make our learning systems as good as the thing that we expect to work on the internet without even thinking of it in our retail lives. That should be possible. But better than that, right? Because learning is different than shopping. And I'll talk a little about how learning works and why learning is different. Some I spend quite a bit of my time on philanthropically. Learning systems, which are really information delivery systems, they can get replaced by these things we're calling knowledge systems. Right? What's in between knowledge and information? We're going to dig into that a lot. But knowledge systems will know enough about the content that they can guide you through your learning experience. But chief learning officers have to be ready for these changes today. This stuff is happening quickly, and it's changing quickly. And the idea that you can ignore, the, ignore AI, and if we've seen all the industries that have ignored AI, and the companies that have been essentially Replaced. The functions have been replaced, and the people who thought it wasn't part of their lives, um, you know, remember when they wish they hadn't made that decision. So it's something you need to engage in, because you can be ready today for the changes that AI implies for learning. Okay. 
So those are my points to the top. AI works, natural language processing, another goal revolution, your data is digital. And so you could at least do as well as Amazon, but you can do a lot better if you understand this thing called knowledge and you can get ready today. Okay, so let's get into it. This slide I put in this deck, so if there are any computer scientists here, I can start a bar fight. <laughs> <laughs> are there any computer scientists here? Okay, well, good. So there we go. Um, this is the history of AI in 1950 today, and it's a little tongue-in-cheek, right? Because I remember, so I wrote my first computer program in 1978. I was eight years old, I had a time at Sinclair. And I got to write a program. And uh, at the same time, I was watching Doctor Who. Because right? um, I was in England, I was born in, born in Belgium, lived in England until I was 10. And Dr. Who's computers did a whole lot more than that time at Sinclair computer, right? Um, and so I didn't quite understand why that was. And so then you realize, we can go on a little, it's a thing called artificial intelligence. And in the 80s, artificial intelligence was five years from working. And in the late 80s, it was five years from working. In the early 90s, it was five years from working. In the late 90s, it was five years from working. Um, and then in about 2006, something happened. It was five years from working, and then in 2010, it worked, right? So in 2010, we get some really big, important AI results. Image recognition, um, we have multi-layer neural networks. I could talk about these if you want, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to say that something changed. Well, for those of us who are in financial services, like I was, we were working on something else in 2008, 2009, 2010. <laughs> um, uh, but, uh, the, uh, but, but something changed in three areas. The amount of data that was available for AI, the amount of compute power we had to bring to bear on that data, and a couple of really important pieces of math that I'm not going to talk about, but there were some really important pieces of math as well. So those three things made AI start working. And so some problems that we thought wouldn't work forever fell by the wayside. Okay, is there a car in this picture? Does anyone want to answer that question? Someone wants, please, someone answer that question. Yes. Yes. Thank you. I taught physics at the University of Illinois, and I signed up for the Monday and Friday 8 a.m. section. <laughs> I don't know how many of you have been at the University of Illinois, but freshman physics at Friday at 8 a.m. was, uh, I was used to pulling answers out of the audience. <laughs> okay, now if you think about, if you had to describe someone, what are the properties of a car? Has four wheels, has headlights, has an engine, has doors, right? None of the cars we see here have four wheels, visible. In fact, almost never when you look at a car do you see four wheels, right? So, right? so um, clearly the way you think sort of algorithmically, if it has four wheels, it is a car, is not how you do computer vision. You do it very differently. And we've been able to do that. So this problem, is there a car in this picture, is one we can now solve with a computer. But in 2008, we couldn't. The interesting thing about image recognition, is, I love this fact, it's not that computers are 100% accurate at image recognition, it's just that they're better than people. Right? So the threshold didn't come when computers could recognize 100% of the images. The threshold came when you took 1,000 images and gave them to a bunch of people, and 1,000 images and gave them to a computer program, the computer program did better. Go ahead. So without going into too much either, what, what changed there? You talked about more, more math, more power, yeah. more data. Can you articulate why computers can do this now? Sure. Um, with this one, quite a lot of it is more computing power. It turns out that to actually do this image recognition problem, you need a big hunk of compute time. Um, but there was one technical anal technical change that happened, this thing called a multi-layer neural net. And it essentially what ended up happening, the way we thought about structuring the program changed. So the first computer vision people thought they would write a program that said, if it has four wheels, it's a car. Mm -hmm. Once you gave up on that and said, okay, I have this really complicated program that's got a million parameters and I don't know them. Mm -hmm. And then I have this other program that takes a whole bunch of pictures of cars and pictures of not cars and runs them through my network changing the parameters until the cars all come back as yes and the not cars all come back as no. That shift in the way you program, the shift in the way you structure that and the compute power will be able to do that, those things are all the things that came together. And a few other mathematical techniques as well, we call convolutions, which we'll talk a little bit later. There, there was some real math and computer science that made it work. Um, here's another thing, making predictions. Is this dot going to be gray or orange? Right? Here's some orange dots up here, here's some gray dots down here. This, uh, we broke these slides rather quickly, as I said, this last 36 hours, so this dot really supposed to be over here, so the answer is more obvious, it goes over here. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, you know, it's, it's not gonna be perfect. Uh, the, um, but, you know, things like this are really important, because this is how you start doing things like taking a look at an image and saying, does this have cancer or not? 
right? And some really interesting stats in medical imaging have come up where we're making predictions. And it turns out that humans are about 97% accurate at figuring out if an image has cancer, that computers are about 96% accurate in figuring out if an image has cancer, but humans and computers together are about 99.997 because the computer mistakes the humans don't make and the human mistakes the computers don't make. So here's an example of a prediction combined with a person that augments your ability to go ahead and understand something as important as does this MRI or X-ray indicate cancer? Okay. Clickers are not something that have undergone the artificial software. <laughs> um, clusters and anomalies. How many groups are in this data? Right? So this is kind of scattered out data. But if you look at it, it kind of falls into these two groups. This sort of cluster detection and anomaly detection turns out to be really, really important because then you know what's normal and what's not normal. This is really useful in like video analysis. What's the background and what's the foreground? It's also really useful in compliance. A lot of us work around compliance technology. Is this normal trading activity or not? Right? If you take all the trading activity ever and say it's normal and then see if all the other activity looks like that, then you can actually do pretty well with artificial intelligence. So this all works. Clusters and anomaly detection. All pretty well understood. But things are changing really quickly. I'm, I'm going to share a result that's less than six months old. It's a fundamental result in computer science. It's going to be historically important. Computers can now win pretty much every game without you having to tell them how. Right? This is the AlphaGo Zero result. So I just want to, the reason I explain this is because you can sort of intuitively understand it, and it gives you an idea how far AI has come. So how many of you know what the game Go is? It's like chess without pieces on a board where you try to encircle other pieces. And chess is, a, in many senses, a tiny game compared to Go. Go has more moves than the number of atoms in the world. Okay? And when uh, Deep Blue beat Kasparov in what? In the late 90s. Um, the best Go player, best Go play computer in the world couldn't beat a six-year-old. Right? Uh, because the game's totally different. So AlphaGo Zero, this Google product, beat it. But the way it beat Go, the way it beat the world's best Go player, was not by them programming it, here's how you play Go. It wasn't even by them taking a whole bunch of Go games people have played and say, go learn these. Right? It wasn't like I talked about with the car. What they did is they said, here's the rules of Go, and here's how you know if you've won or not. Okay, that's something we know. The rules of Go you can write down on half a piece of paper. Say, okay, take two computer programs and have them play against each other. And the one that wins, and they just keep going. So you have no external input other than the rules. Crunch on that on the Google Cloud for a couple of weeks. It wasn't computationally cheap. And out comes the world's best Go player. But also, along the way, it's figured out moves that are now moves that humans are studying. Like, oh my goodness, it won that game by doing this. No humans ever thought of that before. Okay? So then they take this program and they give it the rules of chess. And 24 hours later, not chess games, just the rules of chess, 24 hours later, it's beating the world's best chess game. Okay? So AI means games are now all solved. And at Microsoft, they're not, they're not doing it with chess and go. At Microsoft, they're doing it with Atari 2600 games. <laughs> right? And there's all sorts of weird results. Like one of the Microsoft engines figured out that an Atari 2600 game had a bug, and so the best way to get the high score was to move your joystick like this 74,000 times, and all of a sudden your score went to a million. And found that solution, right? Okay. Computers pick our entertainment. My daughter is 12, as I've mentioned. She can't imagine the idea that you would wait for a television show to be on, right? Like, you know, HBO still does that, and it seems like anti gloomy. Like, I can't believe that I have to wait until the next John Oliver show. Um, but and it gets it right. I, I don't know about this screenshot. I think House of Cards doesn't exactly support my idea, but whatever. We, that's that's <laughs> you know, the we are now used to this concept of clustering guiding what we consume, and this works. Like Netflix recommendations are kind of good. Spotify recommendations are even better. Spotify is probably the best consumer AI interactive. If you use Spotify a lot, it starts giving you recommendations. Those recommendations right. But look, if it's even writing your news. Most sports news is now written by computers, right? They take the box score and they turn it into English. You know, Joe Smith hit a home run in the seventh inning leading the game to a game. You know, that's not being written by people anymore. That's getting written by algorithms. Because those algorithms have learned enough language to be able to generate that from the input. Changing very, very quickly. But there's challenges along the way. Natural language is much harder than math. I love this 
human Brian is still evolving. Yes, yes. I'm sorry, Brian. <laughs> I love the idea of some guy named Brian who's a lot like, oh, I don't know. Uh, but uh, language is really subtle. Right? Here's another example. The zookeeper got a new Jaguar since he loved exotic C A something S. What's the character? How, who says R? Who says T? Right. So the answer is actually T, since Jaguar is lowercase, so it's a cat. If it was uppercase, it would be a brand name, so it would be an R. But there's an example of like something super non-local and ambiguous that's part of language that we all just know. Teaching a computer to deal with that is really hard. I'm not going to talk about the math of it, but I am going to say that the math that's doing this is starting to work. So now let's get to what this means for learning some. There we go. Okay. So the first thing we can do, because remember, learning is about content. A lot of that content is language. First thing we can already do today, this is a program that you can get for free on the internet. We take the sentence, Paul is teaching the audience about artificial intelligence and plug it into a computer program. And it goes, says, here's the proper noun, here's the verb, here's the root verb, here's the adjective clause, right? We can already basically take sentences and rip them apart in the grammar. Good. So like, computers are starting to understand grammar. Um, and here's an application. This is a, ch a charity called Quill.org, and I'm actually the chair of the board of this charity. Um, the Quill is a, a, a charity that is using educational research to change the way we teach writing to middle school kids. Okay, so I'm mean, just for a second going to talk about how you teach writing to kids. If you ask an eighth grade kid to um, write a paragraph about George Washington and they get a B, that paragraph will be George Washington as our first president. George Washington freed the colonies. George Washington died in 1801. George Washington is known as the father of our country. George Washington was a great writer. If it was punctuated and spelled correctly, you would give that a B in eighth grade. Maybe a B minus. Maybe an A if it was hard for grading. Um, the, uh, <laughs> um, but it turns out if you ask that same kid, write a single sentence about George Washington that uses the word although. That's a fundamentally different educational moment. There's a whole bunch of educational research going back about 30 years that shows that. You get a sentence like, although George Washington freed the country, he never freed his slaves. Right? Fundamentally different idea. You have to take two ideas in opposition and synthesize them into one thing. Right? And there was a, you can go find an article written in the Atlantic about four years ago called The Writing Revolution by a woman named Peg Tyre. Peg and I are friends. And, and she, you know, she goes to this school which takes our entire school, it takes every topic, and uses this synthetic approach towards writing instruction, and radically changes the outcome of the kids' uh, kids writing experience. But it was a huge pain in the neck. You know, worksheets this high, right? Um, and you can't do it with multiple choice. You have to be able to do something like, take these two sentences, geese fly south, it gets cold in the winter, and combine them. And if you say geese fly south, and it gets cold in the winter, say, hey, maybe and's not the best word. Maybe that should be the cause. So to do that, you need to understand not just the pedagogy, but you also need to understand the language that's being typed in by the student, and you need to give feedback that works in a human way. So at Quill, we're building this with AI. We've had about 700,000 kids do more than 250 exercises on the platform in the last couple of years. Or maybe you're addressing that while I talk about it, but it's an example of a kind of problem. If you think differently about the way you're dealing with your language-based content, you can change your pedagogy. I change your pedagogy in a way that's based in research, but not feasible to do manually. You can't ask teachers to grade 200 sentences a day in real time, but you can ask a computer to do that. And so, okay, so great. So now we can start understanding language and using pedagogy. Um, here's one other thing that's important. I, I chose this example: Who played flute on John Barleycorn by Traffic? Okay. Um, mostly. Millennial checker, I guess. The, um, <laughs> sorry, I apologize for that. Um, I, I actually had this argument when I was in college, um, before Google, before the internet, sitting on a porch with a couple of friends, and we argued about it for two hours, which is a ridiculous thing to do because now you just look it up and it says right here, Woodwinds player Chris Wood. And the search underneath this is Chris Wood. John Burley Carmen Stice, an album by the 1968 band Traffic, which was Steve Winwood. If you haven't heard it, it's not that great. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> um, uh, but the reason, I bring, the reason I bring this example up is because. Every fact is available to you now, right? Like, if you go to pub quizzes in Brooklyn, I live in Brooklyn, if you go to pub quizzes in Brooklyn, which are fun, there is basically, you know, you have to check your phone in at the entrance anymore. 
<laughs> because, you know, okay, like who won the, you know, who was the shortstop in the 1964 World Series winning team? Like, does anyone here know that? Does anyone here think they couldn't figure it out in 30 seconds? Right? Um, facts are all available for everyone. We, in fact, we suffer from an excess of facts. So this is important. Learning isn't delivery of facts, because if learning is delivery of facts, Google would have it be done. Okay? So what is learning? Learning is a delivery of knowledge. And so what is knowledge? What's the difference between knowledge and fact? And there's a way computers think about this. This is a lovely example that, that say, the, the CEO uh, put together. Computers think about knowledge as well-defined labeled relationships between things. Okay, Barack Obama was born in Honolulu, right? Is politician of the United States, is married to Michelle Obama, right? Here's this, here's this knowledge thing, here's this concept, and here's a graph that attaches it to other concepts. And if you have this graph, you can start asking questions of it, like, huh, you know, is there some state that has more politicians than others, right? Or, I don't understand this concept of a politician. Can you give me an example? Or, I don't understand this concept of a politician's wife. Who have been the last five, right? Those things start coming out of the structuring of data, but that's not all that's there, right? But you can imagine, if we had all the information of the world, not just as facts, not just Chris Wood played flute on John Barber Farm Must Die, but that also attached to the idea that and a flute is an instrument that's a woodwind, and that woodwind has a reedy sound, and that's unusual and rocky outside of the 60s or whatever, right? All that stuff started pulling together. Then maybe you could start thinking about dealing with that fact differently. It's not a linear narrative. It's a navigation to what you need to know next. This is a problem we're working on in college. Because you can already take a sentence like, Mr. Uh, uh, Haruhiko Kurata is the governor of the Bank of Japan and asked, right, you can take the sentence and you can go ahead and infer that he is the governor of the Bank of Japan, right? Um, but that inference on a single sentence is not the same as an inference on a full set of data. So what we're trying to do at Volley is take massive corpuses of data, a graduate biology textbook, everything written about cybersecurity at any regulator, um, for instance. Those are two that we've worked on. And rather than just make them indexable so you can word search them, go and use a computer technique using some of these things I've talked about, using learning, using predicting, using clustering, using natural language processing, and build that knowledge graph. And once you've built that knowledge graph, you can start doing things like, if you didn't understand this cellular reaction, it's probably because you didn't understand this concept that came before it of what a cell is. So if you have a quiz where you get three out of 10 on a cellular reaction, it doesn't say go study cellular reactions. It does what a teacher would do. It says, why didn't you understand it? Well, I didn't understand it. And you'll start talking and say, oh geez, you don't even know what a cell is. Why don't you go learn that next? Because the teacher realizes that's a prerequisite of the knowledge. And the computer is now starting to be able to get that information. So I think the next slide is, yeah. Right. So. That gives us a sort of three-step process that we're undertaking at Bali. Um, acquire the knowledge. This is actually a pretty big problem. How many of you know that all of your learning data is in one place that a computer can actually take a look at it? Right? It's not a hard problem, but it's a big problem. But a lot of LMSs have started solving that. A lot of file management systems have started solving that. A lot of you actually have a lot of your learning data available. Um, communicate the knowledge. Right? So take the information, scan it, build the knowledge graph. Communicate it by rewriting it, rechunking it, resequencing it, showing these dependencies, and then assess the knowledge. Because once you know the graph, once you understand the relationship between all these facts, you can go ahead and build a quiz automatically. Right? Something that may take you five hours to do, give me a quiz that tests that I understand all the prerequisites of, you know, uh, reg D, could actually be done by a computer that could traverse the reg D graph up in its regulatory database. And that, uh, I should have taken a slide out because I just said exactly what I said. Um, sorry, <laughs> I did run this slide, this talk through before I gave it. But this is what we call at Botley the latent pedagogy of information. Right? If you have a big group of information and you can find the connections between it, you know that, and this is, from, this is actually live from Bali's database from the cybersecurity scan, 
you actually know that you know, persistent and threat relate, and they relate to advanced hacking, and that relates to a computer, and that relates to targeted attacks. So if you're sitting here looking at, you know, um, APT, you can go up this tree until you get there. Right? You can start thinking about this knowledge, this connection of information, as being the way that you begin teaching people. Learning can happen through exploring that graph. But people don't explore graphs, people explore stuff on their phones, so you turn it into quizzes and portals and hubs and things like this. Right? That's what we're working on today. Um, or maybe, and this is something we'll be working on tomorrow at Dolly, or tomorrow is maybe next year. Um, you can go ahead and really take all of your data to understand what your people know and how quickly they learn it. What your people know and how, what they need to know next. What the situation your person is in and what do you need to deliver them today? Not in a barbecue means Tom's version, but in a, I've taken a new job as a trader and I showed that I didn't understand this particular regulation and so here's all my prerequisites with a quiz generated automatically, customized for that person. If we can pull it off, and we think we can, we think it'll be an incredibly <coughs> powerful way to change learning. And so, you know, the, the, the mission here is to change the way we think about information delivery to turn into knowledge navigation, right? And deliver that in a way that anyone can learn anything that they need to learn. Um, hugely ambitious. If Carson and Zabe were here, the CEO and CTO, they would tell you that they thought of this company because they wrote down, you know, Netflix movies, Google search, question mark, learning and knowledge, right? So this is not uh, something I want to stand up here and say is easy. It's also not something I want to stand up here and say is done. But it's something that we're aiming towards, and we think the technology will get us there. So that's AI and that's Volley, and I was going to spend some time on questions. So let's go to questions, I suppose. <laughs>